Congenital heart defects refer to structural abnormalities of the heart, or sometimes of the great vessels, that are present from birth and disrupt the normal pattern of blood flow. However, to truly understand what congenital heart disease means, we must first recall the proper anatomy and physiology of the normal heart. The heart, as you know, has four chambers and functions as two perfectly coordinated pumps. Deoxygenated blood from the body returns to the right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava. From there, it passes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which then pumps it through the pulmonary artery toward the lungs. After oxygenation takes place, the blood returns to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins, passes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and is finally ejected into the aorta, distributing oxygen-rich blood throughout the body. Now, congenital heart diseases can be classified into two main categories, non-cyanotic and cyanotic defects. In the first group, the non-cyanotic congenital heart diseases, we typically find defects that create a left-to-right shunt. This means that blood moves from the left side of the heart, where the pressure is higher and the blood is oxygenated, to the right side, where the pressure is lower and the blood is deoxygenated. This abnormal communication causes an increased amount of blood to pass through the right heart chambers and into the pulmonary circulation. As a result, the pulmonary vessels are exposed to higher pressure than normal, eventually leading to pulmonary hypertension. As a compensatory response, the right ventricle gradually hypertrophies in an attempt to handle the increased pressure and volume. The left side of the heart may also become hypertrophic at first and later dilate to accommodate the larger volume of blood returning from the lungs. Over time, this entire process can cause a reversal of the pressure gradient so that the pressure on the right side becomes greater than on the left. When this happens, the direction of blood flow reverses from right to left and deoxygenated blood begins to enter the systemic circulation. This condition is known as Eisenmenger syndrome. Eventually, all of these cardiac changes combined can lead to heart failure due to the heart's inability to perform its normal function. From a clinical perspective, Eisenmenger syndrome manifests through cyanosis, which is the bluish discoloration of the lips and skin. Other common symptoms include shortness of breath, fatigue, and what we call compensatory erythrocytosis, meaning that the body produces more red blood cells in an attempt to carry additional oxygen. In later stages, after cardiac insufficiency develops, fainting episodes or syncopal attacks may also appear. The main congenital heart diseases that belong to this non-cyanotic group are the atrial septal defect, the ventricular septal defect, the patent ductus arteriosus, and the coartation of the aorta. Now, turning to the second group, we have the cyanotic congenital heart diseases. In these cases, Deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart directly enters the systemic circulation, producing cyanosis and shortness of breath. To remember these more easily, we often use the mnemonic the five T's, which stands for truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great vessels, tricuspid atresia, tetralogy of Fallot, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return. In the following part, we'll begin to discuss the most important congenital heart defects, starting with the non-cyanotic ones. We will start with the ventricular septal defect, or VSD. Well, this defect represents an opening in the septum that separates the left and right ventricles, allowing blood to flow from the left ventricle to the right one, thereby behaving as a left-to-right shunt. This condition is in fact the most common of all congenital heart diseases, accounting for approximately 25 to 30% of the total cases. Now let me explain a bit further. There are four different types of ventricular septal defect that can be encountered. The membranous type, which is the most frequent, located in the upper portion of the septum. The muscular type, which can appear as a single or multiple opening, giving the characteristic appearance often described in the literature as a Swiss cheese defect. The inlet type, found near the atrioventricular valves, more exactly near the tricuspid and mitral valves. Finally, the subarterial type, which, as the name suggests, is located near the pulmonary artery and the aorta. At birth, most ventricular septal defects are asymptomatic and may remain so for several days or even weeks. However, over time, the child may begin to show signs of heart failure, such as a rapid heartbeat, fast breathing, fatigue during feeding, and noticeable sweating. Because of the increased blood flow toward the lungs, recurrent pulmonary infections may also develop. When we listen to the heart with a stethoscope, best detected along the left lower sternal border around the fourth intercostal space, we can usually hear a harsh continuous murmur. 
This murmur is often accompanied by a palpable thrill, reflecting the turbulent flow of blood between the two ventricles. On echocardiography, we can observe left ventricular hypertrophy, and in larger defects, even right ventricular hypertrophy may be visible as well. Looking at the treatment options, small ventricular septal defects often close spontaneously within the first few years of life. However, when signs of heart failure appear, medical treatment should be initiated. This typically includes diuretics, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, and proper nutritional support. In cases where the defect is large and does not close on its own, surgical correction becomes necessary, usually performed by closing the defect with a patch. Let us move on to the atrial septal defect. This is an abnormal opening in the septum that separates the two atria. Now, the term foramen ovale, which in Latin means oval opening, refers to a structure that is normally present during fetal life. Its purpose is to allow blood to bypass the non-functioning fetal lungs. Normally, after birth, it closes spontaneously. However, when this closure does not occur, the result is an atrial septal defect, which behaves as a left-to-right shunt, and therefore as a non-cyanotic congenital heart disease. There are three main types of atrial septal defect. The ostium secundum defect, which is the most common, occurring in the upper part of the septum. The ostium primum defect, located lower in the septum, which can occur on its own or be associated with Down syndrome. The sinus venosus defect, located near the entry of the superior vena cava, which is the least frequent type. Clinically, when the defect is small, the patient may remain asymptomatic throughout life. However, when the defect is larger, several symptoms may appear, such as fatigue, shortness of breath, palpitations, and recurrent respiratory infections, which together indicate the onset of heart failure. On cardiac auscultation, the murmur is best heard at the upper left sternal border, in the second intercostal space. Here, we can appreciate a fixed and wide splitting of the second heart sound, and a soft systolic ejection murmur caused by increased blood flow across the pulmonary valve. Echocardiography remains the gold standard diagnostic tool, revealing right atrial and ventricular hypertrophy, as well as the abnormal shunting of blood between the two atria. Smaller atrial septal defects may close spontaneously. However, when heart failure develops, treatment usually includes diuretics, such as furosemide or spironolactone, together with ACE inhibitors. If the defect is large, or if medical therapy does not succeed, percutaneous closure with a device is indicated. To properly understand the patent ductus arteriosus, let us briefly recall how fetal circulation works. During fetal life, the ductus arteriosus is a normal structure connecting the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta. Its role is to bypass the lungs, which are not yet functioning, and to allow oxygenated blood from the maternal circulation to directly reach the systemic fetal circulation. Normally, this duct closes spontaneously in short time after birth. However, when this closure fails to occur, the result is a patent ductus arteriosus, which represents another non-cyanotic congenital heart disease, behaving as a left-to-right shunt. Because the pressure in the aorta is higher than that in the pulmonary artery, blood continuously flows from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. Small patent ductus arteriosus defects are often asymptomatic and typically discovered incidentally because of a characteristic heart murmur. Larger PDAs, however, can lead to signs of heart failure, including dyspnea, poor feeding, failure to thrive, and recurrent respiratory infections. If left untreated, chronic left-to-right shunting results in pulmonary hypertension, and as pulmonary vascular resistance increases, the shunt may reverse from right to left, leading to Eisenmenger syndrome and the onset of central cyanosis. On examination, there is a continuous, machinery-like murmur best heard below the left clavicle in the second intercostal space, often accompanied by a bounding pulse and widened pulse pressure due to diastolic runoff from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. Initial management involves indomethacin, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that inhibits prostaglandin synthesis, promoting closure of the ductus arteriosus. However, in certain congenital conditions, such as tetralogy of Fallot, ductal patency is essential for maintaining adequate circulation, making indomethacin contraindicated. If medical therapy is ineffective or the defect is large, surgical or catheter-based closure becomes the definitive treatment. Let's talk about the coarctation of the aorta. The term coarctation literally means narrowing, and in this condition, it refers to a constriction of the aortic lumen, 
usually located just after the origin of the left subclavian artery, near the side of the ductus arteriosus we mentioned earlier. To visualize this properly, imagine the course of the aorta. It arises from the left ventricle, arches to form the aortic arch, and gives off three arteries, the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. The coarctation typically occurs just beyond this point. Because of this narrowing, blood leaving the left ventricle faces significant resistance and high pressure above the constriction, while below it, the blood flow is reduced and the pressure is lower. Clinically, this presents as strong, bounding pulses with high blood pressure in the upper limbs and weak, delayed pulses with low pressure in the lower limbs. Other symptoms may include headaches and nosebleeds, mainly caused by hypertension affecting the upper part of the body. Interestingly, coarctation of the aorta is found in about 70% of cases in association with a bicuspid aortic valve. It occurs more frequently in males, and when it appears in females, it can be associated with Turner syndrome. On auscultation, best heard on the left posterior thorax, between the scapula and the spine, there is a systolic murmur that may radiate along the back. Echocardiography with color Doppler is the preferred diagnostic method, while the electrocardiogram typically shows signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. In severe cases, especially in infants, survival may depend on keeping the ductus arteriosus open. Therefore, the initial treatment involves the administration of prostaglandin E1 until surgery can be performed. The definitive treatment consists of surgical resection of the narrowed segment with end-to-end -end anastomosis. As a precautionary measure, beta blockers are administered before surgery to reduce the risk of bleeding, particularly intracranial hemorrhage. Now let's talk about the tetralogy of Fallot. This is the most common cyanotic defect, representing up to 8% of all congenital heart disease cases. As its name suggests, it consists of four components, a ventricular septal defect, obstruction of the right ventricular outflow tract, which is usually a pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, and finally, an overriding aorta, which receives blood from both ventricles. Clinically, patients present with progressive cyanosis, which usually is not present at birth, but develops during the first two years of life. Other potential symptoms are shortness of breath, and sometimes, in other cases, poor growth. Episodes of worsening symptoms, known as TET spells, are sudden attacks of cyanosis and dyspnea, caused by a rise in right ventricular pressure, which increases the flow of deoxygenated blood into systemic circulation. They often occur during crying or agitation, and children instinctively squat to raise systemic vascular resistance, pushing more blood to the lungs and relieving cyanosis. On cardiac auscultation, the murmur is best heard at the upper left sternal border, in the second intercostal space. It is a harsh systolic murmur that may radiate to both axillae. Echocardiography remains the most reliable diagnostic method. However, some specific signs also appear on a chest x-ray, where the heart often has a boot-shaped silhouette, a classic feature reflecting right ventricular hypertrophy. In severe cases, treatment begins with prostaglandin E1, which helps maintain the ductus arteriosus open. During acute cyanotic episodes, the infant should be placed in a knee-chest position to improve oxygenation. However, the definitive treatment for Tetralogy of Fallot is surgical correction, ideally performed within the first year of life. With that being said, here we wrap things up. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one, and comment with the topic you'll like me to cover next. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.